Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Flamingo Sundays podcast. Now, very, very exciting news that I didn't realize until just jumping on now. We're with a not once best-selling author on Amazon, but now eight years later, the same book has just hit number one again, hyper sales growth. Jack Daly, welcome to the Flamingo Sundays podcast, mate. Hey, it's I've been looking forward to this since we last talked about a month ago about the prospect of this. If I can impact uh, some young people uh, in their teens and early 20s uh, to go and experience life in a big way, both business and personal, I'm all in. Let's go. Well, mate, you, you definitely impacted my life. The first time that I'd experienced your presence. And, and and for people who don't know Jack, when you're in his presence, people think I've got a lot of energy. He makes me look like I'm a shy, timid young man <laughs> sitting in the corner. Uh, mate, we, we obviously met at the, the EO Sydney event, you know, a month or two ago. Um, and, you know, I, the, 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 the lessons that I learned were incredible. And, and hence the reason I wanted to share it with, with all the listeners. So, for people who don't know Jack Daly, um, thanks Siri. For people who don't know Jack Daly, take us back to uh, to the young, not, not not probably young's the wrong word. Take us back to the junior before he was a uh, before he had a life a life by design, Jack Daly, and um, and, and run us through the story. Yeah, so uh, as succinctly as possible. Um, uh, my first selling job was actually seven years old. I owned the market and charged twice the price of every kid I competed with. I didn't want to play any games when I was a kid. I was having too much fun selling in the neighborhood. Um, at 12, I built my first company. 13 years old, I had five employees. They did all the work. I kept 70% of the money. I'm like, I'm going to do this when I grow old. Uh, and so I went to school and did all the things you need to do to get educated. Between 26 and 46 years old, uh, I built six companies from scratch uh, in the national company, sold a couple to Wall Street, first Boston and Salomon Brothers. And then uh, by the time I was 47 years old, I got tired of doing that. And so I decided I'm going to go travel the world and teach other people how to do that. And so that's where I've been for the last 25 years. And that's how you and I caught it up. And, and when you say you started the first company, what, what was the first company doing? Were you selling lemonade? Were you shoveling snow over there in the U.S.? <laughs> so at seven, at seven, I was selling potholders that I made um, to moms and grandmoms. And the only people I competed with were, were little girls. And, yeah, and so when the, when the mom and grandma would say, well, I already bought potholders from Mary, Sally, and Susie, I just said, yeah, all little girls. You know, you, you got to have at least one, if not two, from a little boy, and I'm the only guy that builds them. So you want one or two. Um, every mom and grandma bought from me. And by the way, that's called owning the market. When you own the market, what can you charge? Anything you want. So I charged twice the price and, uh, and fell in love with selling. So that was that. And at 12, I took a newspaper route of 32 customers, and a year later, it was 275. I sold everybody newspapers. But it was a pain in the butt to deliver 275 papers. And I was ready to quit, but I liked the money. So I said, how do I figure this out? Ah, a bunch of young kids that weren't old enough to get a newspaper route. I hired five of them and said, here, split it up, deliver the papers. I'll pay you some money. And uh, off I went. And it was just uh, awesome. So that was my first company. Um, my, 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 dad, my dad's looking at me. And, uh, and by the time I hit 17, which is the driving age in the state I was in, um, I was able to buy my car for cash, uh, you know, and he never bought a car for cash. <laughs> That's incredible. And the, uh, the, 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 I guess, inspiration behind a company, did you just happen to do it because that was what you did when you were a kid? You, 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 was your mother and father, you know, business owners or, or did you just happen to stumble across it? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, no, no, no relationship to what my parents were doing. Mom was a homemaker, took care of the kids. I'm the oldest of five. Uh, and, and my, my dad was not entrepreneurial at all. I, I, I look, I, I did something very weird, Jack, uh, at 13 years old, while those kids were delivering my papers, I went out and became a caddy at a country club. And, uh, and these guys were playing golf during the week. They were in their thirties and, 
40s and they're playing like everybody works then and these guys are driving nice cars and living in big houses man my, my, i lived in a poor family we, we had seven two parents and five kids in one house with one toilet like we were poor and i'm going my dad didn't my, my dad didn't play golf uh, he, he had six days of the week he's out working and I'm going, well, if I could be one of the two, I know which one I'd want. I want to be that guy in the golf course. So uh, so I decided to interview them. I interviewed all summer long how they became successful while I walked four and a half hours carrying their clubs. And they told me, here's a, here's a, here's a great takeaway for anybody listening in here. They told me these five things. They said, you got to have goals. They got to be in writing. Don't pick too many. Uh, put a date or something when you're going to get them done and share them with everybody else out there to put the pressure on you. So I literally uh, sat down and, and, and came up with four goals where I wanted to be financially, professionally, education and family by the time I hit 30 years old. And uh, I followed that plan and knocked the ball completely out of the park. And uh, it, that success is attributable to the people that gave me that guidance. Um, and by the way, my brothers and sisters are in their 60s. Three of the four of them today are delivering mail for the U.S. Postal Service. They never broke out and had success. Mm. That was one of the most incredible things that 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 I learned when we when I when I listened to you talk the first time was two things on that the 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 ability to understand that the people you were working alongside when you were a caddy because you were essentially working alongside these successful people they were essentially in the position that you wanted to be in or they knew something that you didn't know. So you had the intuition at such a young age to want to learn from those people. I think one of the biggest things young people struggle with is they're always looking for the answer, right? Like the amount of people that message me about, well, how, what should I do here or how should I do it? Um, but, you know, and, and you give them the answer, but they never implement. And it sounds like you you asked the questions, you got the answers that you were seeking, but instead of just collecting all the information, you actually went and implemented what they what they taught. Um, and you know, I think the proof's in the pudding, knowing that out of the four kids, you're, you know, the one that essentially went down a different path and that path happened to be, you know, success. Yeah, I, you know, my, 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 my four brothers and sisters are all living within you know, driving distance of where they grew up. Uh, I'm on the other side of the country. I'm in California. They're back in the Philadelphia, Pennsylvania area. They just, they just couldn't get, couldn't get out of the, out of the paradigm that they put themselves in this small little place. And I just said, Hey, I'm going to live where, where the weather's nice regularly all the time. I'll go to California. And uh, I didn't know anyone like when I got here, I uh, decided to build a company that built some back in the East. So build one here. And, uh, I brought three people with me, and 18 months later, that company was 750 employees in 22 locations in the States. I, now, I'm working my ass off, but I'm having fun doing it, and um, I'm making a few dollars along the way. Sounds good to me. Sounds sounds very, very good. The 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 uh, questions that you were asking, or, or, or I guess when you were, when you were a caddy, because there's a lot of people, when you think about it, that probably come into contact with people who, who are successful you know we work in the real estate industry and you know if you're you know selling or buying a property that's worth a couple of million dollars plus you're consistently meeting people who were of a, of a caliber to you know afford that or you know you could be working at a clothing shop in retail for example where the average price for a bit of clothing is a couple of hundred dollars would you say like if pe young people are working in these kinds of jobs or industries that you know, it's, it's okay or they should, you know, try and be asking questions and, um, you know, searching for answers. I, I, I'm going to go way better than that. Uh, I, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you that there is a book, uh, that is one of my favorite books written called the growth mindset. It's mm -hmm. written by a person by the name of Carol DeWitt. And basically she says, people come into, into one of two versions, a growth mindset or a fixed mindset. The growth mindset person looks at anything that's going on in life and says, how can I make this an opportunity? The fixed mindset person looks at everything that's going on in life and looks at all the reasons why they can't do something, right? I mean, when we got locked down during the pandemic three years ago, uh, I, I, my business was traveling the world and speaking to large groups of people. Well, that business was shut down. Now, an awful lot of fixed mindset people would have said, well, I got to go find something else to do. I said, no, I'll turn one of my rooms into my house into a virtual studio 
and I'll, I'll go and reach everybody virtually. Three months after I did that, I set a Guinness World Record for 21,261 people in my virtual session, right? That's a growth mindset person. You know, Woody Allen said it better than me. You see an angry mob coming towards you, get in front and call it a parade. Uh, like look, <laughs> at, look, look at ways I to like make that. it into a win. So here's the advice to people that are in their teens or early 20s, mid 20s is not only do I want you to ask the questions of people that appear apparently look like they've figured some things out, but but don't hesitate to do that. Don't hesitate to, to ring them up. Don't hesitate to contact them by email. Don't hesitate to walk up to them face to face. I'm telling you, I was of a mindset that said, I don't know that these guys will let me go to their office and interview them. And when I realized that they came to my office, it was called the golf course. We were naturally <laughs> walking around. I just acted like I was just make, making the questions up. I made the questions up for days and then practiced them in my bedroom so that it come off natural. And I'm telling you, you can you imagine after four hours on the golf course with me asking you questions, you go into the clubhouse for a beer and you see a mate of yours and you go, hey, ever had that daily kid carry your bag? Oh, shit, did he ask you the questions? <laughs> I mean, they're going to be laughing like crazy. Everyone knew me in the club. I'm the guy that was asking the provocative questions. How'd you get me? How'd you, how'd you become so successful? What were the five biggest things you did to make that happen? What were the three biggest mistakes? What would you tell a 13 year old? What would you tell me not to do? All I'm, I'm just knocking them all over the place. It's so interesting. No, and I, it's, it's fun. The, 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 I think you're, you're so right. A lot of people feel, and I was definitely in this category that, people who are at a certain level who essentially, you know, have the answers to the questions that we're looking for. Um, we feel like that they don't want to help, you know, and, and you see it all the time, especially with social now where, you know, people will comment on posts and go, well, if you know the answers, why, why, why don't you just retire and do nothing? You know, like, but the reality is, I think when people get to a certain level they, they want to help, right? Like me asking you to come on the podcast or, you know, something similar on the lines or asking you a question, um, you know, for, for, for something that I was searching for, you, you don't really need to answer, right? It's not like you need to spend an hour to do this, but it, it, people like yourself enjoy doing this kind of, kind of stuff. Uh, look, it, it, you know, I've been on stage with Richard Branson eight times. And here's a guy that's my age that's built over 200 companies operating under the Virgin brand. But I'm going to tell you that if, Richard, if you contacted Richard Branson and you were in your 20s or you were in your teens and said, hey, I'd like to pick your brain, he would spend that time more than he would on his business. Mm -hmm. He would get a kick out of that. Just no different than I get a kick out of it. When I wrote my most recent book, Jack Daly's Life by Design this year, I, I three months after it came out, I got an email from a nine-year-old kid. And the nine-year-old kid said, I just finished reading your new book, Life by Design, and I just want to thank you for it. And I know it was written for older people, but man, this book inspired me. Let me tell you, I've got three goals right now. One, start a business. Kids nine, start a business. Number two, read 50 or more books a year. And three, get straight A's on all my courses. I, I'm like, I want to meet that dude. I like, come over to my house. I want to put my arms around you. I want to show you how to get there. Let's do it. I'm going to go into business with them. Incredible. And it's, yeah, it, it, it's so true. And I think that's a big takeaway is, is making sure that you're sure you're going to get rejection. There's going to be people, you know, who don't reply or, or don't answer the question, but I would say 80 plus percent of, of, of people that you approach will be more than happy to spend the time to be able to do it. Right. Hey, look, Jack, you've heard me speak. I make a lot of analogies between business and life and sports. Sport. Right? Yeah, yeah. And, and so, you know, when you think about basketball, you think about Michael Jordan and Michael Jordan asked to take the shot when no when there is little time on the clock the the winning shot and he took 700 plus winning shots and he only made 130 of them but you don't make any unless you ask for the shot got to ask for the shot forget about the ones you don't make forget about the guys that turn you down you don't need them anyway all you need is a few people that are going to invest in you and, and Jack, on that, do you feel like, you know, if you were to look at success and look at your life, would you, do you feel like that 
one of the big contributors to to building the life by design and, and living a very successful life, not just commercially, but in other aspects we're going to touch on, have come down to the people that you have met along the way and and the doors that that's opened. No, no, no question about it. So, so uh, t- two big things: having a destination. Can't get there unless you know what there is. I ask people all the time, how many people want to be more successful than they are already? Every hand's up. But then if I leave the stage and say, well, what's success, Jack? I get nothing. People can't articulate. If you can't articulate where you want to go, no one can help you get there, right? And then the second thing is one word, grit, G-R-I-T, never, ever give up. You know, I didn't know how to swim. The the Australians just crack, crack up at this. I did not know how to swim at 58 years old, but I wanted to do the Ironman, which starts with a 3.8 kilometer swim on the clock, then a 180 kilometer bike, and then a 42K run. I want to do the Ironman, and I don't even know how to swim at 58. Between 58 and 66, I did 15 full Ironmans, four of them in Australia and the world championship in Hawaii, right? And so, you know, hey, uh, but but what what did I do? I want to do the Ironman. That's my there. That's where I want to go, right? What do I need to do? I need to hire a coach to teach me how to swim. Guess what? I didn't stop there. I hired a swim coach, a bike coach, a run coach, an overall triathlon coach, a nutritionist coach, and a strength coach. I had six coaches that t- were telling me, here's what you need to do to be successful in the Ironman. Four years That's- later, I'm in the Ironman World Championship. What the hell is up? At 58. <laughs> At 60, at 64. That's incredible. That's incredible. And and let's push on to whether the lifestyle by design. You said you wrote those goals down after you learnt them on the golf course from caddying. By 30, you'd essentially, you know, you'd hit all the goals that you'd set out. Um where where did the journey lead you from from the golf course to to 230? What what were the really big goals that you wanted to hit? So um, financially, uh, I, 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 wanted, I, wanted to, I wanted to be in the top 5% of people in America on my annual income. And I had a specific dollar amount of net worth that I wanted to have by the time I was 30. Um, uh, professionally, I said I wanted to be the CEO of a company that was national in size by the age of 30. Education, I said I wanted a bachelor's and a master's by the age of 30. And family, I said, I want to be married and have a couple kids. And all those boxes got ticked off. They just got ticked off. I mean, and there's so many stories, Jack, where things happened in my life and I went right back to my goals. Here's, here's, where it's, here's what's happening. Now, in, in order to be the CEO of a national size company, I was reporting to a CEO of a national size company. And he asked me, have you ever thought about what you want to do when you grow up? I said, oh, shit, yeah, I've been doing it since I was 13. The problem is you have my job, and I'm looking, I'm, I'm looking to leave. And he said, don't leave, and before you're 30, I'll, I'll hand the keys to you. One day he knocked on my door at the office, and he said, hey, kid, and I looked up, and he threw the keys to me and said, it's yours. I'm going to Wall Street. And, and all of a sudden I'm running a national company. But you, you, you can't get there if you don't know what there is, and you can't get there if you don't ask. Yeah, that was something I was just going to say. Do you do you believe that if you know you wouldn't have put it out to the universe as well? You know, it sounds like you you, you said very openly to the the current CEO, "I want your job." Essentially, um, do do you, do you believe that's another big factor? Is you know people call it manifestation, whatever whatever you want to call it, um, but putting it out there and being vocal about what you want to achieve, as well as doing the actions that you know you need to do to be able to achieve it. I look, I, I don't I don't I, I don't I don't worry about anybody measuring me out there. So I put it out there. Absolutely. The reason we're hesitant is because maybe we'll be embarrassed because we didn't get something done, didn't accomplish it or what have you. I, look, outsiders opinions don't mean shit to me. Uh, the only thing that matters to me is what I want to do in life. And, you know, I, I got on my bucket list. I have over 400 items and over 300 are done. I've run a marathon in all 50 of the United States. I've run a marathon on all seven continents. I've run 100 marathons. Uh, you know, I, my first one, Jack, wasn't until 46 years old, right? I mean, this is, this is crazy stuff. And when you put it out there, watch this one. One of, my, one of my bucket lists was to play the top 100 golf courses in the U.S. 
I've got 96 of these completed. And every time I'm in front of an audience, I just throw it out there. And guys come up to me and go, have you played this one? And give me their card and say, I can get you on that one. But nobody can help you if you don't know what you want and you don't put it out there. It's so true. Fuck, it's so true. And and the... The, the, the fascinating thing, which again, I didn't know until I heard you talk was you publish your goals list every year. I don't know. I not only publish my goals, I publish my bucket list and I have five people that I give my goals to. And I say, I want you to go line by line and call me out four times a year. That's 20 times people are spanking me if I don't get my shit done. And who, who are those people usually? Are they people close to you? Are they just randoms from social media? Uh, I, I, here's, the quali- here's the qualifications. People, people that care immensely about me and won't take any of my bullshit. They got the courage to get in my face. So my son is too loose and he wouldn't qualify. But my daughter is a hard charger. There's no way that I'm showing up and saying I didn't get it done. Previous business partners are on the list. My lifelong best friend that I met when I was five years old and we're still friends today, he's on the list. Those guys will shoot me straight. Yeah, and they probably know you better than anyone. Yeah, and, 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 and you know, when I send out my preliminary goals before the year starts, uh, they'll come back and say, I, I think this one might be a little bit too aggressive. And then we'll argue about it. Sometimes I'll roll over and take it off. Most of the time, I just win them over. <laughs> and they what do you mean I can't do that? <laughs> well, something that I, I was fascinated about, you know, you said around the marathons, you didn't start until, you know, your mid to late 40s and then the Ironman, which is something that I could, uh, you know, not even imagine the, the pain you go through when you do something like that. It, it was in, you know, your, your 50s. Was, was fitness a big part of your life when you were younger or did it only become a thing when you were, you know, getting, getting through life? Yeah, fitness, I've always been fit. Um, when I was 28 years old, I put on my bucket list to live to 125. And the only <laughs> way I was going to do that was to take care of myself physically. So wow. I've been very attuned to, to taking care of the unit here, right? But but why the, the, the question then is why did I wait until later? And so there's only so many hours in the day. I'm running a very fast-growing business that I have to spend time with my employees and building the business. And I've got young kids and a wife that I want to make sure that I'm with my kids while they're being young and growing up. I, I got a wife, I got two kids and, uh, you know, and employees and a company to run. So between 26 and 46 years old, I, 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 I'm busy with them. I don't want to give up my kids. They're, they're going to grow older and leave and go to school and then go on their lives. So until the kids got out of the house and until I sold my companies, I didn't have the luxury of running and training for marathons and Ironmans. And once they were all done, then the only person who was making a sacrifice was my wife. And so I met her at 16 years old. Bonnie would have done anything for me. So no, no harm, no foul. That's very fascinating, Jack, as well, because I think a lot of people, um, are always looking for like the perfect morning routine or, you know, what are the, what are the things that I must incorporate in, into my day? And I think, you know, f- there's cause and effect of everything, right? And there's going to be, be sacrifice. And it sounds like that what was more important to you when, when you were coming up was growing the business and spending time with your family. And as you got more free time because you could step away from the business and your kids were getting older, then fitness become a bigger priority at that point in your life. Yeah, so, I mean, look at it. Look, look, I said I had four goals by the time I hit 30. Financial, professional, education, family. You didn't hear me say fitness. Mm. But if you look at my goals today, fitness is the number one thing. Because science tells us if you want to live a long, happy life, you got to take care of yourself. Be fit, right? So, you know, and I just took fitness to another level with the races. Because if I got a race, I know I'm going to train. And have you always been extreme? You know, like the goals were, were quite extreme. Top 5% of income earners in America and, 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 you know, the US would be the highest incomes in all of the world. So it's a top 5% of the world you would want to be. 
um, you know, the CEO of a national organization, again, the, of the biggest country in the world. Um, and then you look at your fitness goals and it's not just to run, you know, 10 Ks a day, but we'll run marathons and then we'll run it in every state in the US. And then actually we've done that. Now we'll go Ironmans and I can't even swim. So I got to learn how to swim. Have you always been, you know, the extremes and, and, and pushing the boundaries or has that been something that you've come to love? Always, always, <laughs> always. Um, I, I, I was raised Catholic. Uh, I'm not a practicing Catholic today, but I was an older boy. Um, I, I, in the seventh grade, I was the head of the older boys. I had a hundred older boys that I was managing, um, what services they were going to do, so forth and so on. I, I, when I was 17, I went to work in a grocery store. It had 200 employees. By the time I was 18, a year later, I was assistant store manager in, tar- in charge of 200 employees while I was going to school. I, this I, I, my bucket list right now says I want to meet a president in the Oval Office. And when we're done there, well, I want to get on Air Force One and take a ride on that. Uh, I, wanted, I, want to, I want to run with the Olympic torch at the Olympics. I mean, you know, people look at me like, well, that's, you're never going to get those done. Well, you told me I wasn't going to get an Ironman done either. Uh, you told me I wasn't going to run a marathon in all 50 states either. I mean, you know, you told me I wasn't going to run in a marathon in Antarctica. Uh, you, you, nobody thought that I could run a marathon on the Great Wall of China. All that stuff's done. Hey, let's go. Do it. Look, there's a really, uh, look, I, I read 104 books last year. Here's a great book, Relentless. Relentless is written by a guy by the name of Tim Grover. He was the trainer for Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant. And he's the guy that's credited with taking them to a level that was way above everybody else in the NBA. And the, and the, and the deal is I'm, I'm unrelenting. I'm relentless. I mean, it's my wife, you know, I got remarried after I lost my first wife to cancer. Karen is my new wife and Karen read the book relentless audio version in the car. And she came home from work one day and she said, I just finished the book relentless. She goes, I'm going to listen to that book every month for a solid year till I almost have it memorized. It's so impactful. And she goes, and then the second thing is, aha, I finished the book and went, I live with Relentless. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, just what, what something I wanted to touch on is, is you know, you said there that, that you lost your wife, which would have been one of the most challenging things I'm sure you've experienced in, in your whole life. And, you know, I think a lot of people look at everyone's success journeys and think it's a linear fashion of just better and better and better and better and life gets better. But, you know, I think everyone knows it's probably not the case and there is tough times. How do you deal with challenges and, and, and things like that? I wouldn't even call a challenge. Like it's, it's, it's life changing and it can destroy some people. Like how do you get through things like that? And, and even with sales, you know, rejection and, and disappointment and, and, and loss. So you, you, this, this might be your best question asked today. That, truly, Jack, this might be it. Uh, here's what I want to tell the listener, that you can hear all of these accomplishments by me and think, uh, this guy's led a blessed life, and I have. But you know what, along the way, I ate more shit sandwiches than most people in life. I've had businesses that were ranked in the top 10 in the country that went and I stood in front of 275 people and had to fire 240 in a day because of an economic calamity. Um, um, my, my daughter, who's now 51, I got a phone call. She lives on the East Coast. The doctor said, we're, get on a plane immediately. Um, we'll try to keep her alive until you arrive. She was, I talked to her in the morning that day. She was fine. She wasn't even in the hospital. I'm about to lose my daughter. I thought it was a practical joke. And she spent three years dealing with cancer, cancer recovery, all of that type of thing. My son was a methamphetamine addict in three jails. Um, and, and, and today he's 43 years old and he's 17 years clean and he's kicking ass and an entrepreneur and a, a dad and a, a husband and three kids. And, but but here's a guy that that doesn't have any of his original teeth. He got, he's had dentures since he was 23 years old. Um, uh, you know, and, and uh, my wife, I met her at 16 and lose her when she's 67 years old. 52 years of, 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 of a relationship with this lady. And all of a sudden, I'm 68 years old. Love of my life is gone. Uh, the good news with that one 
is that she was diagnosed in February of 17 and she didn't pass until November. So I had nine months with her and we got to live our life in reverse and go through all the reels of what we did and just hug and kiss and talk. And she helped me say, here's what I want you to do when I'm gone. I don't want you to curl up in a corner. You got too much life. Go out and just suck the marrow out of life. Go make it happen, Jack. Make me proud of you when I'm gone. Those conversations I had with my wife, that's awesome stuff. You know, yeah. here's the answer. The, you have to focus on that which you have control over. I, I, I don't have any control over Bonnie dying from pancreatic stage four cancer. All I can do is hold her hand, hug her, and join her in the battle and the journey. And then when she passes, she passes. We're all going to pass. But I'll tell you, if I was going to lose my wife, I'd rather have nine months not notice than some cops show up at my house one morning and say she's in an accident and dead. Right. So so, you know, I'm grateful. I, my, the word I use all the time is I'm grateful for so many things. I uh, we were locked down in March of 2020 on April 1st. The doctors diagnosed me with stage three pain, uh, malignant melanoma on the top of my head. Uh, they had to cut uh, the top of my head and take out the size of the palm of my hand, about an eighth of an inch thick. They said we got it all. Eight months later, it came out of my neck, and I had to go 54 weeks of treatment in the cancer center. And two months ago, I was declared cancer free. While I was in the cancer center, I ran four marathons, including Athens, Greece. You know, hey, you know what? Spit on any of it. I'm going to take this sucker down. I am cancer free today. Uh, but but I've got an attitude. I'm going to fight it. I'm going to do whatever is needed to do to win the battle. And that's all I can ask of myself. So it sounds like it's it's essentially perspective looking for the the positives in everything, as hard as that would have been, I'm sure it's easier now on reflection saying that, but as hard as it is in the moment, um, you know, looking at whatever the positives are and, and what the, you know, as Tom Panos always says, he's, a, he's a, a pretty famous speaker in Australia. He says the best, the best gifts in life usually come badly wrapped. And, um, you know, it sounds like you, you always try and look for the positives. A question on, you know, getting, diagnosed probably a personal question diagnosed with cancer like it's probably the worst news you could ever hear in your life when you heard that did what, what like what, what did it do to your perspective or what did it do to you know the the way i mean you've lived your life pretty extremely to this point but you know that there's usually for most people you hear there's a a, a a click when they hear something like that they realize how precious life is did it change anything for you or was it essentially just living the same life at making sure that you fight it the, 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 I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, my heart, my heart rate didn't even move, move a notch. Uh, I just looked at the doctor and said, all right, so what, what is, what does stage three malignant melanoma mean? He said, within a week, we got to get in the hospital and take your top of your head off. Uh, I'm like, and then are we done? He goes, yeah, we should be done. I should be able to get it all. I said, let's go. What are we waiting a week for? Can we do it today? Let's go. Let's <laughs> go. Right. Let, let's, let's go. Uh, and, and, and my doctor said the second time that I got it, they said, the reason that you recovered like you did is because of two things. You're in unbelievable, unbelievable physical shape for a guy your age. I'm 73 years old. And the second thing he said is that your attitude is unbelievable in terms of positivity. You channel energy and positivity all the time. And so those two factors are contributors to beating the cancer so essentially lifestyle and mindset yeah I, the mindset is huge i'm i'm convinced it's more than 50 percent. and so if you think life is shit and you're you're going to be right and if you think life is grand you're going to be right well I, you know people ask me all day long today hey uh, how you doing today fantastic that's how i'm doing you know why? And I and the guy says, why? And I go, because somebody got up before me and picked shitty. It was already taken. So I decided I'm going to be fantastic. I mean, really, <laughs> like we own, we own our space. My mm. wife was driving home one day from work and she said, I've had a bad day today. You know what I said to her? Why would you choose that? And there was a whole space in between that she didn't say anything. And she goes, 
I didn't choose it. And I go, oh, yeah, you did. We get a choice. You can let that negative shit in your head or you can just not let it in. Choose and not to have a bad day. Have you worked on, on the mindset over your life? Have you? I mean, you've always been high energy, like you said, but have you always been a positive thinker? Have you always looked for opportunity and things or is that something you've had to work on consistently? I mean, you read 102 books last year, so I can imagine some of them are on mindset potentially. Yeah, I, I, look, I, there's 10% of, of all my reading is on the on my, on mindset. Uh, uh, Relentless is about mindset, right? Uh, so, so yeah, I'm always working on it, uh, but I've always been at it. I mean, it's always been that way. And I, 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 we got one life to live. I'm going to live it to the max, and I'm not going to let anybody take me down attitudinally. I'm going to have a great day. No matter how much is out of control, I'm, I'm sitting in my office here. I got work all over the place and uh, I could get depressed almost with, you know, how far behind I am on all the things I'd like to get done. But you know what? Uh, I get done more than 99.9% of the people on the planet. So um, and and who who's going to yell at me? Huh? Nobody's yelling at me. Me. <laughs> Just yourself. On, on to some more sales um i guess topics which you're you're an absolute gun at and uh mate i've implemented a lot of the stuff that you uh you outlined in the in the talk matt matt my videographer who who come and filmed the day and, and filmed everything that happened i had about four pages worth of notes that he was writing while he had the camera running so i was very uh, i was very happy with that but Sales, I feel like, is, is 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 a skill that you know most people use in their life, regardless if they're in a sales based role or not. You know, you're either selling to your partner, or you know, you're you're selling to a family member, or you're selling in your job. Um, and it's it, sales is really communication. It's a skill that you will use every single day of your life. How I mean, energy is one thing you need for a sales job, but then skill is another thing. How, how how have you gone about, you know, going from a, you know, a seven-year-old or 12-year-old kid in a business selling newspapers to, you know, now being one of the, the top sales gurus in the world? Like, what's the journey look like? Uh, you know what? You are so right. You're always selling in any environment, home, everywhere. Um, uh, it, 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 here's the key. What did I do when I walked the golf course with those guys? Four and a half hours, I asked questions. Um, people think that they get in sales to pitch. I remember making a tour of India, and every time I'd stop in a new city, these guys would run up before I even took the stage and all excited going, you're going to teach us some new pitches? You're going to teach us new pitches? And I'm going, no, I'm going to teach you to not pitch. People don't want to be sold. Quit selling people shit. Help them to buy. Uh, see if there's something that you have that will help them in some way. If that's the case, it's easy to sell it uh, because if they need it anyway, uh, it's going to help them. But I, I don't need to pressure anybody. I just need to be in front of enough prospects where what I'm trying to sell, they want to buy. It's easy. So it's essentially all questions based and, and leading them down the path to, to, to understanding that they need something as opposed to giving them all the reasons they need it. Let me drop this on you. Two, two big things. Uh, people buy from people they trust. What are you doing to create trust between your prospect and you? And then the second thing is people do business with people they like. So what are you doing to get them to like you? But if you got somebody that likes you and trusts you and has a need, they're going to buy from you. It's a slam dunk. Let, let's touch on those two things. So if you were, you're, I'm assuming you're not selling on the phone or selling face to face anymore, but to, to get people to trust you, like other than the normal stuff that everyone would know, which is, you know, be a, an expert in what you sell, have a good process, you know, be able to, to show evidence what are some of the, 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 the top things that you would do to be able to help someone trust you or, or get them to trust you, whether it be questions, whether it be tips and, and tricks? Yeah, I'll give you one that's really powerful on that one. Um, um, I, I, will always, I always like my, my sale to be second, not first. In other words, 
if I could find a way to introduce my prospect to somebody that could help them in some way before I even talk about my product or service and they get with that guy and get fixed when I'm ready, when, when, when I'm ready to touch them and say, Hey, you want to buy my stuff? They're buying. I mean, heck, you didn't even go after me. You, you just turned me on to this guy. You didn't need to turn me on to that guy. 30% of all the leads that come into my company, I give to other people around the world and say, here, you doing. And is it usually in the same field? So if a lead comes in, are you trying to refer them to someone who may be able to help them with something else? Oh, I'm asking so many questions and finding out where their greatest pain is. And if their greatest pain is not my product or service, I'm just going to hook them up with the guy that can solve their pain. Wow. And I don't care what it is. I'll get a guy to come out and wash their cars or I'll get them to replant their landscape. And I ain't in any of those businesses. I what am I what do I care about your damn landscape? Well, if I can get the guy sobbed on his landscape, he'll listen to me on whatever I'm doing. So essentially building a relationship and creating some reciprocity. Absolutely. And then on the other on the other side, so we've built trust. Um, and then, you know, naturally I feel like the more hyperactive you are, the the more personality you have, like you and I. The, the more someone either really loves you or the opposite, they really dislike you. How, how do you, how do you, you know, create an environment or, or create, you know, a space where someone can, can actually like you for who you are as opposed to what they perceive you to be? Yeah, again, I'm going to cite another book. I mean, like, this is why I read so much because I become a huge resource. The book is called The Platinum Rule. And Tony Alessandro, when he wrote the book, said, we all know the golden rule, treat people like you want to be treated. But Tony says, turn it into platinum and treat them the way they want to be treated. What that means is I'm going to figure out what kind of a person you are. And then I'm going to modify my person to be more reflective or mirror yours. Right. So I, I'm known in a, in, in a, in a clinical way. Uh, my my style is a driver. I'm I'm pushing. I'm going for it, right? But but a, a, the opposite of me is an amiable. Well, they're 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 they they talk lower and slower, and so you would find me slow my speaking down, lower turn, and so this is the way. Look, if the amiable is like that trying to sell to me and I'm this high energy guy, I'm going to throw them out the building, like get out of here. Right. But, but if I can get them to feel like, Hey, this is the guy that I can work with. Uh, so I'm going to adjust my style. And there's basically according to Tony, four basic styles out there and three quarters of the world is in a different style than you are. So if you don't modify your style, you, you have the possibility, probability, of losing the deal three quarters of the time, even though it was the right product or the right price and the right service, because people didn't like me. Well, I, once I learned that, then I'm going to change my style. Absolutely. Mm. So it's essentially, you know, using some neuro linguistic programming. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, but but you need to be able to do it quickly, and there are ways to do that quickly. And you know, it's in the it's in Tony's book. That's gold. People always ask about books. What book should I read, mate? Well, they listen to this podcast and by the end of it, they'll have a year's worth of reading. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Look, here's here's the book they need to read. I was just going to touch on that. Yeah. Like you, you, your first book is very sales focused. It's, it's about how to become a high performer and, you know, create that, that income that's going to put you in not just the top 5%, but the 1%. That's hyper sales growth. That's that book. But this that, book, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, let, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna let a guy that the millennials really know who this guy is, Simon Sinek. An awful lot of people know Simon Sinek. Let me tell you what Simon said about this book. Thank God Jack Daly exists. For decades, we hired Jack to teach us how to sell better. Yet all the while, what he was actually teaching us was how to be better human beings. That's this book. That's cool stuff. That's gold. And Simon's probably one of the most influential leaders in the world when it comes to leadership and, and how to be a better person. 
Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I'm having dinner with him in about a week and a half. Um, he moved from New York out to L.A., and I'm near L.A., so we'll get together here in about 10 days. It'll be good. I love that. Mate, on that book, you know, Lifestyle by Design, you, you're in your 70s now. You've, ha- you've lived a lot of life. Um, it, it, it does sound like from a young age, from what you learn on the golf course, that you have always known what you wanted and what you wanted to get and, and what you wanted to be, and you've always worked towards those goals. But now reflecting back on your life and you know, uh, th- there's a saying where it's always easier to, I think Steve Jobs said it in, in one of his talks, he said it's always easier to connect the, connect the dots when you're looking back at them as opposed to when you're in the, uh, you know, when you're in the, the motion. Um, what would you say some of the biggest learnings now looking back in, in retrospect that you've had to be able to create this incredible life by design um, and to do what you love every day and, and like you said, have fun along the way as opposed to just being a grind? Uh, it's not the quantity of the relationships that you build. It's the quality of the relationships you build. Uh, uh, When I graduated from high school, my high school class was 275 kids. Uh, I knew less than 10. Wow. And if you weren't going to add value to one of my four goals, I didn't want to hang with you. I mean, I I I, I've had my goals since I was 13. Are you going to contribute to one of those four? And if not, I don't have time for you. So I, I, have, I have less than 10 people that I graduated with that would know what my name was. Uh, but, but, but the guy who wrote uh, at the beginning of this book uh, in the foreword is a guy I met in kindergarten. And we went to grade school together, high school together, university together. We were uh, commissioned as officers in the United States Army together. We served our military together. We worked in five companies together. We were married the same year, stayed married to the same lady our entire lives. And we both have two kids and the kids are the same ages. And ever since college, our blended family have gone off on vacations and holidays together. I mean, I would challenge the kids that had all of these friends uh, and, and say, okay, wh- wh- how many do you have now? How many of them do you know? We pass through too many people in life that are not contributors. They're detractors. They take away other than add. I want people around me that adds value. And then I would tell you this. Anybody that's listening right now, this is absolutely essential. I want you to think about and write down the names of the five people that you spend the most time with, but none of them can be blood-related. Five people that you spend the most time with. And then ask yourself, are these five people taking my game up or are they pulling me down? And the other way to ask that is, are you the smartest guy in the room? Because if you're the smartest guy in the room, you're in the wrong room. You need to be, you need to be the guy that's like striving and pulling up the ladder and, 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 and grabbing off of the trousers off of everybody above you, learning from them all the time. I mean, you know, we we have a program on TV over here called Shark Tank. I don't know whether that's in Australia or not. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's uh, 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 every one of the guys on Shark Tank is a friend of mine. Uh, you know, I mean, who do I want to hang with? I want to hang with the sharks. That's gold, and and I think that's a huge. In, in the day and age of social media, we're so caught up on how many followers we have and how many likes and views we get. But the reality is, you know, none of those people really care about you or very few of them are actually going to be adding to your life. So less is more from what I'm hearing. Absolutely. Yep. And I would tell you on the sales side, uh, again, too many salespeople call on too many people that don't deserve to be called on. The better salespeople actually call on less people, they write more business. The key is they call on the right people. How can you build trust and a relationship when you're calling on thousands of people? It doesn't work. Mm, it's so true. So I'm going to find where's the, where's the great opportunity, guys, and I'm going to camp out with them. And and Jack, on, on less of a... Um you know, commercial level and, 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 and I guess bettering yourself level and more on a personal level. Like, is there something now that you look back on in your life and, and, the, and they may not be, but, you know, I think a lot of people, I watch a lot of interviews with older people and they look back and go, oh, I wish I would have spent more time with my kids or I wish I would have spent more time doing this or I wish I would have spent less time worrying about X, Y, or Z. You know, looking back now on 70 odd years of life, do you, do you see that? 
like, oh, fuck, I wish that doesn't matter. That shit doesn't matter, which may matter a lot in the time. So I'm going to give you a really weird answer to that. Um, I, I'm not I'm not disagreeing that you might be able to learn some 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 things from your past that could help you in your future. I, I'll allow that to be happening. Uh, but quite frankly, I don't participate in much in it. So what I tell you is this. Uh, when I when I when I'm driving a car, I don't have a rear view mirror. I only have a windshield in my car. You know why? Because I can't do shit about the things in the rear view mirror. That's I, I, that's yesterday's news. And so I, I don't stay. I don't I don't. I, people ask me, how long does it take you to get to sleep? Less than two minutes. I'm, I'm, I'm shot. I'm worn out. I left it all on the playing field. I'd say it. That's how I play life. Leave it all on the playing field. You don't have any sleeping problems. And you're out like a lot. Boom. Right. I get up in the morning. I got my to do list. And before I, before I'm even having breakfast, I got shit that I'm getting done. I'm in, I'm in the gym every morning at 5 a.m. I'm working out for an hour and a half to two hours to get the day started. That's the start of my day. When I'm finished here, it is 4 p.m. in California right now. As soon as we're done here, I'm out to the ocean for a beach run for about an hour, hour and a half. I, I, I'm working out two and a half, three hours, four hours a day. Uh, there's nothing better than that. And, and then, and then, and then you can go. Well, wait a second. There ain't enough hours in the day. I'm, I'm, I'm optimizing my hours, guys. I'm, I'm not, I'm not playing small. I'm playing big. I'm playing a game where I'm playing with the people that are going to give me the most in my life. Got to play big. And again, it's the quality over the quantity. For sure, absolutely, mate. That is gold. I don't care if no one else got anything out of this, mate. I've gone away with two pages of notes. <laughs> Jack, just just before we finish up, so I can let you uh, let you get down to the beach and get into that run. What what's one thing that that you'd wanna that you'd wanna leave on? Um, look, if 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 anybody listening, I don't care if you buy this book. I don't care. Here's what I do care about. Go to the website, jackdailyslifebydesign.com. Just go to the website. Half of this book is an appendix, and it's all on the website. All of the templates, the forms, and they're filled out by my data, and you can model mine and do yours on the blanks, and you can design your life to be exceptional. Like the problem, Jack, is we, we do things like this, and very few people take action. This is not going to cost you anything. Just go to the website, pull them, pull down the data, and put yourself together and, and put a game plan together. Simple as that. And on your website, which I learn after hearing you talk, you've got so many videos and so much information, downloads, PDFs, um, which is, what's the website if, if people want to go there? So this website is not very deep. This website is just the appendix, but the website with my business of selling and business, that's jackdailysales.com. We have over 300 short videos on there you can learn from. Yeah, we have four magazines that you can drop down. I, the amount of stuff that you don't have to pay for, I don't care about the money. All I care about is, can we move, can we move the dial? I got a guy in Sydney that saw me speak five years ago um, and, and he was making $80,000 a year. Today, he makes more than a million dollars every year. How's just, the sales guy? Just on that, actually, I just remembered something you said. Jack, can you, can you quickly tell the story before you wrap up about the young lady who saw you at one of your talks or, and then a few years later met you in the hotel lobby of a hotel? Yeah, so that's Liz. Um, she's in the, in the ranking of the top 100 Business women in America, um, she she's she's ranked uh, above Ellen DeGeneres in net worth. And when I met her, she had a little company of four million dollars in sales with seven salespeople. Today, her company is the largest company in the world in their field. They have over eight hundred million in sales with over four hundred salespeople. And and I also tell you, Liz said asked me if I would sign her copy of this book. And I said, why? You're, you're the one that should be signing it. She said, because I built that entire company off of that book. It just wasn't written 20 some years ago. 
And so I was just coaching her. Uh, I mean, these are these are the great stories, right? The, the ones where people are doing something. I, it doesn't matter how good of a speaker I am. It doesn't matter how good my content is. The only thing that matters is people take action. Nothing works if you don't take action. It's gold. And if and if that won't make you take action, then there's there's no hope. <laughs> <laughs> you change the channel. <laughs> That's right. Mate, that was absolutely gold. I thank you so much for your time. There's going to be... Uh, I'll, see, I'll see you next year. We're going, to, we're, going to, we're going to head back down again. I look forward to seeing you, mate. Thank you. You bet. Stay healthy.